The Mark on the Wall by Virginia Woolf Perhaps it was the middle of January in the present year that I first looked up and saw the mark on the wall. In order to fix a date, it is necessary to remember what one saw. So now I think of the fire, the steady film of yellow light upon the page of my book, the three chrysanthemums in the round glass bowl on the mantelpiece. Yes, it must have been the winter time, and we had just finished our tea, for I remember that I was smoking a cigarette when I looked up and saw the mark on the wall for the first time. If that mark was made by a nail, it can't have been for a picture. It must have been for a miniature. The miniature of a lady with white powder curls, powdered dust cheeks, and lips like red carnations. But for the mark, I'm not sure about it. I don't believe it was made by a nail after all. It's too big, too round for that. I might get up, but if I got up and looked at it, ten to one I shouldn't be able to say for certain, because once a thing's done, no one ever knows how it happened. Oh, dear me, the mystery of life, the inaccuracy of thought, the ignorance of humanity, to show how very little control of our possessions we have, what an accidental affair this living is after all of our civilization. Let me just count over a few of the things lost in one lifetime, beginning for that seems always the most mysterious of losses, what cat would gnaw, what rat would nibble, three pale blue canisters of book-binding tools. And yet, that mark on the wall is not a hole at all. It may even be caused by some round black substance, such as a small rose leaf, left over from the summer. And I, not being a very vigilant housekeeper, look at the dust on the mantelpiece. For example, the dust which, so they say, buried Troy three times over, only fragments of pots utterly refusing annihilation, as one can believe. The tree outside the window taps very gently on the pane. I want to think quietly, calmly, spaciously, never to be interrupted, never to have to rise from my chair, to slip easily from one thing to another without any sense of hostility or obstacle. I want to sink deeper and deeper away from the surface with its hard separate facts. To study myself, let me catch hold of the first idea that passes. Shakespeare. Well, he will do as well as another. A man who sat himself solidly in an armchair and looked into the fire. So, a shower of ideas fell perpetually from some very high heaven down through his mind. He leaned his forehead on his hand, and people looking through an open door. And then I came into the room. They were discussing botany. I said how I'd seen a flower growing on a dust heap on the site of an old house in Kingsway. The seed, I said, must have been sown in the reign of Charles I. What flowers grew in the reign of Charles I? I asked. Tall flowers with purple tassels to them, perhaps. And so it goes on. All the time I'm dressing up the figure of myself in my own mind, lovingly, stealthily, not openly adoring it, for if I did that, I should catch myself out and stretch my hand at once for a book in self-protection. In certain lights, that mark on the wall seems actually to project from the wall, nor it is entirely circular. I cannot be sure, but it seems to cast a perceptible shadow, suggesting that if I ran my finger, down that strip of the wall it would, at a certain point, mount and descend a small tumulus, a smooth tumulus, like those barrows of the South Downs, which are, they say, either tombs or camps. No, no, nothing is proved, nothing is known, and if I were to get up at this very moment and ascertain that the mark on the wall is really, what shall we say, the head of a gigantic old nail, driven in two hundred years ago, which is now, owing to the patient attrition of many generations of housemaids, revealed its head above a coat of paint, and is taking its first view of modern life in the sight of a white-walled firelit room, what should I gain? Knowledge? Matter of further speculation? I can think sitting still as well as standing up. I understand nature's game, her prompting to take action as a way of ending any thought that threatens to excite or to pain. Hence, I suppose, comes our slight contempt for men of action, men, we assume, who don't think. Still, there's no harm in putting a full stop to one's disagreeable thoughts by looking at the mark on the wall. I like to think of the tree itself, first to the close, dry sensation of being wood, then the grinding of the storm, then the slow, delicious ooze of sap. I like to think of it, too, on winter's nights, standing in the empty field, with all the leaves close furled, nothing tender, exposed to the iron bullets of the moon, a naked mast upon an earth that goes tumbling, tumbling all night long. Ah, 
The mark on the wall, it was a snail.